Robert Deerberg now recalls the atmosphere in the cutting and dubbing rooms at the time. Well, I know, I know all the picture editors had a, had a very hard time because um, it took a long time to get shows completed. From my point of view, yes, it was, it was fairly hectic, uh, but I, it was the first music job I'd done. I was enjoying working on it. I put a lot of hours in it. Um, so it was, yes, it was hectic, but it was enjoyable type hectic uh, because, you know, it was, a, it was a good show and a worthwhile show. As music editor, Robert Deerberg occupied a cutting room next door to the sound editor, Wilfred Thompson, who also had difficulties achieving what McGowan wanted. In talking with Wilf, I know that he had, uh, he had a, 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 a lot of pressure on him and uh, sometimes found Pat a very difficult person to work with because uh, the demands of that particular show, uh, particularly trying to build up the effects on, on Rovo, would give uh, a sound editor a challenge that he wouldn't, he wouldn't have on uh, a routine TV show at the time. So that the, the creative element that almost every technician, right from the cameraman down to, you know, almost the assistants, were having a definite creative input into the show in that they were making I mean, I think from, from uh, Wolf's point of view, they were making noises for uh, elements that didn't have noises. So, so they had to put quite a bit of creative thinking into it. I mean, I'm sure that, that Pat helped, but I wouldn't mind betting that in most cases, it was a case of Pat making a suggestion, and then Wolf would have to go away and work with, um, work in a, a sound recording stage with several elements to try and get the correct effect, then would have to mix them in a theatre to show to Pat to see whether he was happy with it. And undoubtedly, in a lot of cases, he wouldn't be happy first time round, but would perhaps remix those elements and get, and get the effect that he wanted to. With Robert Farnan removed as theme composer, Wilfred Josephs was brought in to replace the rejected theme, recompose some of Robert's incidental music, and finally produce a new score for scenes which as yet had no music planned for them. Wilfred recalls how he was commissioned. Uh, I was working with Don Chaffee. I had been working with Don Chaffee, uh, the director. Did a couple of films with him, and uh, he had mentioned my name to Quentin Lawrence, Christopher Moran, Anthony Keary, and then later uh, Pat McGoon, uh, Patrick McGoon. Uh, and so I started working suddenly, doing a lot of television, and uh, everything snowballed one to another. And then came this uh, call to go to the studios uh, about this uh, strange and unusual series, uh, which I understood there were several people who had already written music for. And I understood several people were likely <laughs> to write music after I did. Uh, it seemed to be rather uh, a mixture of everybody writing. Uh, why, I don't know. That's always the great problem of a director or producer, whoever decides on the composer, uh, to know what he wants exactly. And if he knows what he wants, to put it over to the composer and he's, he's afraid of the composer who uses a language that he doesn't understand, like semi-breves and minims and crescendos and things like that. And uh, I met Patrick McGoon, we got on fine, we had a drink in the bar, it must have been MGM studio in Boreham Wood. Don Chaffee and Patrick McGoon and I, and uh, we had a drink. And uh, uh, then he, uh, Patrick McGoon, uh, said to me what sort of music he envisaged for his theme music. And uh, this is where the whole problem of communication comes in between a director using words and pictures and a composer using notes and sounds. And uh, I would have been perfectly happy if he'd said to me, uh, Something like uh, the Elgar Enigma Variations is the sort of thing I want, or something like uh, uh, Pop Goes the Weasel, 
I wouldn't have minded what kind of music he wanted. What I didn't want was to be confused. And what he did do was to say uh, there were three things that he felt were necessary, and I can't remember what the third one was. The first two were mind-boggling. The first was, uh, uh, like little boxes, uh, the current thing that was running at the time, uh, uh, was it Sonny and Cher, I think it was? Or uh, singing little boxes, little boxes. Da dee 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 little um bum 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 da da dum bum. The words ticky tacky come into it somewhere. It's a children's type song and uh, it's that kind of thing anyway. But the thing he wanted to combine it with, in a way, was the Beethoven choral symphony. And I mean the choral bit, you know, da da dee 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 dee. Ba da 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 dum ba dum. Uh, but slow and majestic, you know. Well, how those two go together, God only knows. And it, it would have been a laugh if it weren't so serious. But anyway, I uh, duly nodded and made remarks and made the right sort of sounds, and I went off with a sheaf of notes, and, and I wrote my own thing, the thing that I thought was going to be right. Wilfred's recording session took place at the Denham Studios on Monday the 2nd of January 1967, a mere 13 days after Robert Farnan had recorded his score, although it would appear that this second attempt at a theme tune was scheduled to be recorded the previous Wednesday, the 28th of December. However, the most startling date is to be found on Wilfred's first draft score for the opening sequence, which is dated the 22nd of December, only two days after Robert Farnan's recording. Given some understanding of the time allowed for composing his music, we can now see that Wilfred Josephs produced an innovative soundtrack whilst under immense pressure. <laughs> 